So, Eddie Bowman. That's me. We're going again, brother. Wednesdays and Fridays. That's nice, man. <laughs> so glad to have you down here. I, now you know what I drive every day to go to right. work. Right. Oh, no, that's mad. But you know I live two hours north of the city now. I live at the farm. Oh, you do? I live there. I drive down and I stay in hotels when I'm working. All right. On. And some days I just go surf the couch at one of my kids' houses, right. you know, go see the grandkids. How long did it take you to get here today? Takes two hours and twenty minutes to get here. Wow! From my farm. And wow. Your boys are in Toronto. Oh yeah, they all got places in the city, but they come up yeah. to the farm on the weekends. Well, you have a lovely parting gift for your efforts. I love this man. The cups, uh, the shit, uh, but uh, uh, I'm a tea drinker. This is perfect. You're perfect. <laughs> man. Love it. <laughs> hey, so how long you been in the film business? This is like my forty-first year. I got in it when I was twenty-one years old, and I'm t- coming up on sixty-two years. Right on. And the big thing that. Randy, you know as well as I do, the film industry's changed so much. Big time. Like, big time. Like, back then, and this is why we have Bowman Sound, is because, as you well know, and something you didn't know working where you did, but when we used to get jobs, it didn't matter if you worked on the show or not. If Randy worked on the show, I went to the rap party. Everybody went to everybody's rap party because there's only like five crews. So when there was a rap party, it's it's night heat. No, no, the rap party. Yeah, no, no, it's here. And everybody would show up. Even if they they did one day on the show, they're coming to the rap party. And nowadays, they're totally different. You're not allowed to bring people. And it's like it's all changed. So... Intent. That's why that was the intent behind Bowman Sound. So how long? How long wow. has Bowman Sound been running? We've done four of them. Okay. We did three at the farm, and we did one at the Elma Combo, and we're probably going to do another one in May at the Elma Combo. Oh wow! Because what it is is like, I don't know, um, Christina Coots. She's a set dresser. One of my favorite people in the business. She's, you know, it's when she came to Bowman Sound, Jake goes, hey, Dad, there's this crazy lady looking for you. And I went, tell Christina I'll be there in a minute. Because <laughs> I know, you know Christina. She's, yeah, you know, she's a sweetheart. That's but hilarious. She's live. And I love live people. You know, anybody <laughs> can be a stiff. This person's live. And they're my, they're my friends. So she goes, your dad said she, I'd get a good parking spot. And he goes, yeah, my dad says that to everybody. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> but but she came up to me after the album <clears throat> combo and she went, this reminds me of an old school rap party when everybody just came to have oh, a good time. It didn't matter if you, and you got to, she goes, I seen people I hadn't worked with in five, six years, you know? And it's, that, wow. as we get older, you know, it's, you start going, I'm not working on that show or I'm not working on that show. But meanwhile, you've known this person, you know, you did, you did top cause, like your dad will tell you, we did one show back at, um, 35 years ago because it was Jake was born on Top Cops and he just said, a second Top Cops was 35 years ago yeah just a second I got a cough <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> holy shit right yeah man but what I used to say is anybody that did Top Cops yeah. could do any show 100% that show was three units five years no waiting tons of episodes tons because of, of the, sh- episodes the short little per vignettes show. every one of the shows there was an A unit a B unit and a C unit and splinters so you had four units running all the time oh wow and it was like oh we're in Jeez. Pittsburgh we need Eddie we need 25 Pittsburgh PD cop cars well no we're shit. only going to have a couple of them they're going to be PD cop cars <laughs> they're going to be the front and center ones the rest will all look similar I did so many episodes of that show everybody did yeah I did every one of them yeah you know, and and when you did five years of that, well, all the people that you worked with, you became really good friends with because sure. we were raising our kids, having our lives. But you're working, and see, the funny part is, Randy's probably the only other one in this room that knows what it's like to work a shooting twenty hour day. Mm. They don't do that. Yeah, I, yeah, I've been around a long time. Yeah, you done you know, twenty hour days since, on set? since a young guy, but yeah, twenty hours. I think Shooting? actually my longest day is 18 and a half hours. Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. We used to do 20 for fun. All right, all right, fuck off. No, no, and, and, <laughs> and I'm not going to lie. Uh, the first big feature I did was The Fly. Yeah. And when we were on The Fly, I remember the first day was 18 hours. Yeah. We didn't put nothing in the can. No <laughs> film. That was a test run. 18 hour test run. Yeah, and they I, don't I, even do <laughs> almost 30 you know what I mean? hours now. No, no. It's like, I, I love it when you're on a show and they go, <clears throat> holy shit. We're going 15 yeah. hours today, and I'm like, oh, 
<laughs> 15 hours. I know. You know. What'd you do with the rest of your what'd day? What'd you do with the rest of your day? You know, <laughs> did you go home and see your wife? No, you did. You went to the bar, didn't you? That's how crazy we are. Instead of going home where you should, when we used to go, like, we used to have unbelievable times. Like, have you had Dwayne McLean on this show? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Dwayne McLean used to have a boat called Free Fall. <clears throat> yeah. And this boat, I can't tell you the things that went on on that boat. Oh, really? No, no, but this was a boat where anybody that was anybody would show up, and it was always an unreal party. I'll tell you a little story. Wow. Driving along down there to go to free fall, I'm driving along in my Jaguar. All of a sudden, this uh, explorer comes flying up beside me on the Gardner. We're doing 100. I always drive at 140, 150, right? <laughs> this stunt guy gets out of the roof of the, jumps on the roof of my car, and climbs in. It's Larry McLean. He didn't want to pull over, so we oh. did it on the gardener. You imagine what would happen if you got pulled over, <laughs> leaping from one car to another, right? Uh, and, nowadays, no. no, no, you get, you know, <laughs> you're getting big trouble for that stuff. But That's Larry funny. lives in L.A. now, right? No, Larry lives in here, but he just spends a lot of time in. LA. Okay, so I want him on this show. Yeah, Larry, I'll, I, he's coming to Bowman Sound. Yeah, we he we, said we communicate, coming. me and Larry. Yeah, I like Larry a lot. Like you know, we hung out a lot. And this guy, you know, I was there when he had his country western song. He really did have a country western song happen. His wife, who was like Miss Georgia or somebody, left him. He got drunk, flipped his truck, and then we're on set. And he calls his dog, and his dog gets run over in front of all of us. Oh. All within three days. Oh, my God. And, and I'm sitting there, and like, Larry's my friend. I'm, my heart, his dog was his best. Do you remember yeah, his dog? He, that he, I, I was there. It's like, and I'm a dog guy. Worst thing that can ever happen yeah, to you oh happened to him. And he got by it. Like, he's a strong man. Those things. Uh, you got to get by. Yeah, well, you have no choice. Really. Yeah, what yeah. do you do? Slit your wrist because your dog got run over? Yeah, yeah. it sucks, but yeah, you totally. got to carry on. Yeah. But uh, we've been there, we've all been there for so many things in our lives that were like monumental. When you meet people and you and you go down that road with them, you know what I mean? Yeah, man. It's kind of like your dad. My son Jake goes, do you know Randy? And I'm like, uh, yeah, of course I knew. I knew Randy when there was only 12 stunt guys. Totally. Okay? There was only 12 <laughs> stunt guys. And you know how many stunts I've done? Not got paid for them? I dropped a bike on, on a night heat. This, for real yeah no no we're in Yorkville and the stunt guy didn't show up imagine this the stunt guy didn't show up so they what? want they want to, no just didn't show up there wasn't enough guys to go around bud okay. that's the thing there wasn't enough drivers there wasn't enough stunt guys there was five crews and we knew everybody like you could phone somebody up and say hey you're not using that generator yeah I need it can I come steal it? yeah come get it they're, they're, that's all gone now it's like no nope, you didn't get, oh you don't have a generator too bad it's sad because our business was like a little family. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people like, you know, the film industry is not a job. It's a lifestyle. And that's a fact. Totally. You know, you can't, you know, other people that don't work like we do, they don't understand it. Like uh, my sister's a banker. And, you know, at Christmas, like all my kids, my ex-wife and all my brothers were filmmakers. They all worked for me. So she'd go, I'm so sick of hearing film. I go, Tell us what's going on in the bank. <laughs> Did you start at 8 o'clock this week? Yeah. Not me. <clears throat> I got home at 8 in the morning. Yeah. You know what I mean? We have different lifestyles. I'm with a, you. But it's yeah. a lifestyle, and I couldn't change it for nothing. Of course not. I couldn't. And you no. either, you're either you either in or you're out, and, and this is what I tell everybody. I've met some of the coolest, nicest, smartest people in the world. Totally agree. I met the other ones, too. Yeah. There's a bunch of the other ones in our, in our business. But we've been trying to boot them out slowly, but some of them can really <laughs> yeah, stay yeah, on yeah. yeah. Some of them have been around. <laughs> like, I wasn't supposed to talk about this guy, Stefan Steen. <laughs> 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 but this guy, he should be an accountant somewhere. He should not be in film. Really? Yeah, no, we're filmmakers. We're a different breed. We are. And, yeah. and you have to be. You know, my kids were raised on it. You were raised on it. You don't know any different. But the regular job that people have... Come on, man. You know? Yeah, I get it. I, I couldn't imagine doing that, go to the same place every day. Like, even when we're in the studio for too long, I start going buggy. You know, I need to... This job was the perfect job for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and I yeah. did every job. I've been a production manager. I've produced, I've produced albums. I've done all that shit. I've been lucky enough to be with... My whole 40 years in this business was <clears throat> film and rock and roll. 
I did the biggest rock and roll shows ever. I was the transport coordinator for the Rolling Stones on the Steel Wheel Tour. Like that that Jesus. day, I tell people this story and they go, what? I go, Mick Jagger was, I was a superstar in my eyes. It's the only guy I ever got where, oh my God, it's Mick Jagger. Yeah, yeah. And he gets in, he puts his hand on my leg and he goes, you're going to take care of me, man. And from that minute on, I was like, yeah. And we started being buds. Like, and, and I did every, the funny thing is I said to my wife when we did it, I went, it's a once in a lifetime deal. Well, no, it's a 12 time in a lifetime deal. Yeah, yeah. Right. But what happened was we did the Steel Wheels tour and then we went to Montreal. And this story is actually pretty funny because we're in Montreal, we're in a booze can. And usually when I'm doing security, people come up to you and go, hey, how'd you get the job doing security? And I was giving the fuck off answer. I was going, I used to be an undercover cop. <laughs> they're gone <laughs> I know and then, and that's then they, brilliant no no and they fuck right off they don't ask you another question this guy says to me he goes well if you're an undercover cop I'm on the job and you better get it, get your people out of here this place is getting busted and I was like <laughs> everybody on the buses let's go and as we're getting on the buses with the Rolling Stones and leaving this booze can the cops are coming around the corner and the cop that was talking to me whips out his badge and lets us go well I got all the shows then. Like any big show that came to Toronto was mine because everybody knew what happened. Yeah, brother, you got some cred there, man. No, no, big time. Whoa. And the thing was that I also, you know, the next gig <clears throat> I got was Led Zeppelin, Bruce Springsteen, Neil Diamond. I got to do everybody. But I worked all week on film, and on the weekends I did rock and roll. You know what that does to your family life, right? Hmm. Yeah, I can only imagine. No, no, it, it, it makes it go away. And the yeah. funny thing is, you know, Jenny, I, I love her to this day. She's the mother of my three kids. Sure. But you cannot have a girlfriend when you're running that kind of gambit. Yeah. You know, and would I no. change anything? Not a thing. It is how it is. I got to do things that people, you know, I, I tell people, I get to do things people dream about. Make time. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. you do too. We mm -hmm. get to do things that people dream about. Absolutely. And then, you know, to be on a movie set, well... I've been on all the movie sets, and yeah, it's work for me. Where some people were like, "Ah, oh, I got." I've seen people lose their shit to be on a film set, and I'm like, "Yeah, tell, yeah." Tell, tell it becomes a job. Well, see, that's when people start bitching. Yeah. They start bitching about what they do in film, and I, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, there are people out there right now dreaming <coughs> of being in your position. <coughs> Just exactly. fucking lighten up. That's right. No, I know what would give their right arm to be there. Hundred percent. Oh yeah. You know, and, and the film business has got me in with some friends. Like, I've known your dad forever. Like, I, I we were kids when we met. This is like yeah. 40 years ago. You put 40 years on. I remember when you looked like that picture right there, Randy. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? totally. And no, but that's the thing. I do. <laughs> and, and most people, your dad remembers me as that skinny little transport coordinator yeah. that made shit happen. <laughs> and I always had hot rods. Stunt guys always hated it. I'd come flying in sideways in my car. And they'd all look at me like, what the fuck? And I always had nicer cars than them. I did. And it, hey, speaking of nicer cars, you have a nicer hat than a lot of people that I see. And you have something on there that you said was uh, a Zeppelin thing. This Can kid, we explain? This oh, hat right here was the backstage pass for Led Zeppelin. Like, that's how you had all-access pass. Wow. And it pinned on your jacket. No way. I okay. have a picture of when I was with Led Zeppelin. And it's really funny because this is an iconic picture. But you send that to me and I'll put it up on the podcast. Okay, so I'll, I'll get it to you and I'll send it to you. <clears throat> but the, these pictures were like iconic pictures. Like we used to get all our pictures done at just one hour photo. Yeah. My picture in Led Zeppelin was stolen 12 times from the place. Like they always used to put pictures of the stars. So mine was up there. The girl goes, it's been stolen 12 times. So I'm telling Karen <laughs> Perez that and Karen Perez goes, I stole one. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And that's the truth. Wow. You know? But besides that, uh, I think this is really cool what you guys do. And I think that if you get to talk to people that are in our business, it's a pretty it's a pretty cool deal. There's a lot of people that are worth talking to that are amazing people. That's why you're here. Yeah, that's right? yeah, exactly. And we've had some pretty we started, amazing guys we, here We so started far. off. I built all the trucks for the film. I built the first craft truck ever. Really? First, we were doing a show called Adderley, and they wanted a truck. Everything used to be in panel vans, bud. They used to bring donuts and everything in a panel van, and they'd build a little, like, tables, right? So I built the first craft truck. And uh, how, how, how did that come? Really? How did that come That apart? was on a show that called Adderley. It was a series with Winston Record, which was a very cool cat. Yep. And it was all Canadian cast, and it was a very cool show. It's where I met my wife, Jenny. She was loading into okay. her makeup there. And it was really funny because uh, 
the guy at the time that got me in the business was a guy named Tom Osman. And Tom Osman was a guy that taught me all the things to do and all the things not to do, right? Like he was one of those guys that he did things that you went, well, you know, <laughs> he had a fight with the hair and makeup chick and he slashes her tires. Oh, I had to fix oh, her tires. God. No, I had to fix her tires. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're the boss and you went and slid his, her tires. Now I got to fix them. And we're in the middle of a unit move. Good move. Who were who you mad at? You know what I mean? When you, you know, but, but he also <laughs> taught me how to do my job like nobody else. And um, it got bitter because I started getting shows that he thought he should get. And he brought me in. There's always that shit. Yeah. Right? But he was a guy that, you know, lit himself on fire and then went, why do I smell smoke? Well, you did it yourself, you know? Like he made a gay slander of a director one time when we were working. And it was the one time that I seen, yeah, don't ever, ever say anything stupid like that. Because Tim Bond came up and went, that truck's got to move. And Tom turned around and said, beat it, you little ah. And boy, was that a mistake. Damn, yeah. You no, know, I seen the producers running. <laughs> they were running. And I see Bob Worth. You remember Bob yeah. Worth? I remember Bob Worth. He runs at me, and I'm like, Bob, <clears throat> I didn't say nothing. And Bob goes, no, no, you're not going anywhere because that guy is fired, and I need you to do the job today. And I was like, whew, he's fired. No, gone right then. Put him in a car and see you later. Yeah. You know, you're not allowed well, to Well, that's make... just fucking yeah, stupid I mean, Yeah, shit. that's just no, ignorant it was. shit. And it was. And you know what? There was a lot of things <clears throat> that Tom taught me that was amazing. And then there was all the shit that he did that wasn't so amazing. So we learned, right? Mm -hmm. But he was the one that got me in the film business. He's the guy that taught me how to do my job. And he also taught me all the things not to do. So yeah, you, no you mentioned shit. your job. So you're a transport coordinator primarily in the film business at this point particular juncture yeah is that you correct know what? no to tell you the truth i'm driving more than i'm coordinating oh like, is that right no i i did a big show called mayor of kingston yeah i was I, the stunt coordinator on that yeah that was the biggest show i've ever done yeah yeah we got a bunch of pictures yeah, no, around well, all the stunt <coughs> yeah, that picture right there exactly you know i want to hear something really cool i stole the cornerstone rock out of the kingston pen I well, go, well I, we'll keep it between us i don't give a shit what are you gonna <laughs> come get me I go down to the corner of the pen every day, smoke a joint, and wiggle a stone, and, and scrape it For out. Real? Oh yeah, no, I stole the cornerstone. He, he was escaping. Yeah, you know the only person to escape from Kingston, you know him. Oh really? Dean Kafko. He escaped what? from Kingston Pen. There was a there guy was, that went over the wall. That, that was King, yeah. That was Dean. Are you joking? No. no. Dean was the only guy that that broke out of Kingston Pen. Yeah, but. No, that can't be right. 100%. Because we were told a story about a guy that went over the wall. No, not that one. The new pen. Millhaven. He was in Millhaven. Oh, okay. Okay, he not the old one. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Dean? This I can the believe. The stunt guy. Yeah. This. Well, yeah. Well, his dad had a stroke. They wouldn't let him go see him, so he broke out, went and seen his dad, and then knocked on the door and went back in. That's respectful. Seriously. I love Seriously. that. Seriously. You took a... There's the best story about that is. Just, so there's a fucking movie in that. No, no. There's a movie in Dean, 100%. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> like, Dean, Dean was the most deadly guy I ever met, and we became really good friends on the Hulk. And it was really funny because we were doing <clears throat> Resident Evil in this this Chinese world champion kung fu stunt guy comes in and all the stunt guys are over there rattling his zipper telling him how great he is and i walk up to him and i go so uh what happens if you and my friend dean go at it and this guy lost all his shit oh i, I would never fight dean no 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 and i'm like why he goes well, i fight for points he breaks shit he'll kill me yeah no, he breaks shit <laughs> yeah. and it was really funny because a lot of guys like steve lasescu and tough guys in their business that we know are serious tough guys they would not even fuck around and say, oh, I could do this. You know that. Yeah. How yeah. many guys did he put in his place? I know. And I, so when he walked by, and I said, that guy wouldn't fight you. And Dean goes, see? I <laughs> <laughs> you know what? One of the nicest guys in the world. It was a shitty how it ended, but yeah. one of yeah. the best stunt guys, all around good guy. Like, we've lost a bunch of guys that were really good guys. Like, there was a stunt guy you would have never known named Ty Cody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I've met him back in the day when I was young. You had to have been a kid. He yeah, was. I, I was, was. I was. No, but I'm but saying I've he, been around a while. His de he was one of the nicest people you ever Anton, met. Anton, Anton. Too. And uh, I was supposed to go up in his helicopter with him. And the funny part was he kept calling me to do it, and he called me the day that he got hit by the plane. Oh wow! Right. So I very well could have been in that plane. 
to be to be honest, I actually I remember the day very well because I remember the call to Randy. So yeah, no, no, we all were very good friends. All that's what I'm saying. Yeah, the group that we had back then. Yeah, we all knew each other. Like the, the, every stunt guy, every coordinator, we all knew each other really well. Yeah. Like there was yeah. a small group of us. Now there's what, 4,000 filmmakers in Toronto? Yeah. There was yeah. a couple hundred. We used, to have to, we used to have to mooch guys, stunt guys. Lots of times they called me to be the fourth car in because they knew that I wouldn't rear end somebody or I could slide it around a the corner. There's a scene at Top Cops. So we're all doing this big race down, down Queensway, high speed pursuit. Camera cars right behind me. I e break my Mustang and I turn and I look at the camera and I go, <laughs> and the producer freaks. He goes, "We gotta redo that, Eddie." <laughs> There's been a few of those things. Like, you know, <laughs> we had those moments up in up in Kleinberg one time. You know, back in the day, it wasn't okay to smoke dope, so you had to take your vehicle and go for a drive. So me and Greg McGrath drive up the river behind. And we don't realize it's call time yet because we've been there for three hours before call. We're smoking a joint. We're coming back. And I have a loudspeaker on my 4x4 because it's like a cop sheriff's vehicle. And I'm <clears> singing <throat> la da 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 singing along. Coming around <laughs> the corner, the whole crew is standing there looking at me. <laughs> and they're like, we're trying to roll. And I just put it in reverse and backed up around the corner. <laughs> shot. But those things have happened many times. <laughs> Greg's been with you forever. Me and Greg have been best friends since we were 10. Oh, is that right? Since we're 10. Wow. And he still comes like he was at my farm last week. <clears throat> there, I have three friends. I have a friend named Ronnie Plunkett, Greg McGrath, and Randall Wise. Yep. They've all been best friends of mine since we were 10. Wow. And now we're all in our 60s, and we still work together. Yeah, it, yeah. Like We worked on Umbrella Academy, and it was really funny because... Me and Greg trained everybody. We trained every driver that's in there. Anybody that's any good in IA came out of the school of mine and Greg's school of teaching you how to do transport. Right on. So Jimmy Ryder, we brought in the business. He was one of my brother Bill's best friends. And uh, so we're working for him. And we're allowed to do whatever we want because we get the job done and he doesn't question us. So he comes down and he goes, what's going on? I go, well, Greg's fishing. Randall went to get us ice cream. And I was going to have a little nap. And he goes, carry on. You know what I mean? That's, that's how it is. But we've also, we've done, the, we've, done the, we've done the days. Yeah, man. You know, you put that many days in, that's how it works. And a couple of young guys were talking to Jimmy like, why does this guy Eddie get to leave early on Friday sometimes? And Jimmy goes, because he taught me everything I know and you should mind your business. You know, that's the straight goods. I love it, man. And to talk about John Reynolds, what I'm working on right now. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a an idea for a show called um, Resort Rescue, and this guy I know, Markham, is running this place called the Oakwoods out in Grand Bend, and it's a nine-hole golf course, and they want to put a spa there. So I went out there to be like the guy, you know, from. Uh, Bar rescue where the guy walks in and goes, that person's an idiot. Fire that person. Oh yeah, right. Love that. Show. They, right. they kind of want me yeah. to do that at this resort. And as if you well know, working in film, we've stayed in every resort you can. <laughs> so I know what's good and I know what's bad. My oh, wife. Interesting. You know, that so we're out there doing this, and then all of a sudden they go, "You do Bowman Sound. Would you like to do part of the Elvis Festival? They're moving it from Collingwood to Grand yeah. Bend. Wow. Oh, are they really? Yeah. So I said." Absolutely. And I said, by the way, you know, I have the bus that I bought off Ronnie Hawkins that played Elvis's bus. So we can park that there. And I also have Elvis's gates. So, what? Yeah. What do you mean, Elvis's gates? I got the gate. They rebuilt gates for Priscilla. They met. They okay. Oh, oh, yeah. From yeah, Graceland. Yeah. And I got the gates. No shit. Yeah. Chris Hatcher the gave them to me. So the thing is. So I'm out there talking to him, and now this guy that comes along with this is this guy named John um, Reynolds, and Reynolds starts talking to me because I did rock and roll in that, and it finds out that he was a good friend of Ronnie Hawkins, and I lived with the Hawk for 15 years because I dated his daughter. So I lived out at, out at Hawkwood, uh, at Stony Lake with the Hawks, and uh, for 15 years. No, my kids think of Ronnie Hawkins as grandpa, eh? Really? Like that's a fact. And, you know, 
So I meet this guy. We start talking. He starts talking about the guy that used to drive Ronnie, which was Heavy Andrews. And I'm like, okay. And we start talking about rock and roll. And the guy says to these people, if you guys are going to shoot my uh, rockumentary, I want Eddie Bowman to be the director. No way. So I start looking into this guy. And this guy's pictures, which I will send you pictures. Yeah. He's got the picture of mm. Jimi Hendrix with Chum FM. And he's got pictures of the Rolling Stones. He went on tour with ABBA. And he's got four million pictures of stars that would blow your mind. So I'm sitting there listening to this guy. And we start hitting it off because, you know, if you're sitting around a bunch of people that are filmmakers, we all have that conversation. Sitting around rock and roll people, you have those conversations. They know if you've been down that road or not. You can't con a con. No, you got it. So yeah. they look at me and they go, oh, this guy, I, not only have I been there, I've been there for the biggest shows in the world. Like, Steel Wheels was the biggest show I ever did. And I, and if you have to ask me, one of my most exciting driving parts in life was driving out of the Rolling Stones Steel Wheels. I had a 12-pack van. I had Mick Jagger and the, and the five <clears throat> the Rolling Stones in my back of my car with the security. I had six cops on horses, six cops on bikes, and we're cutting a path through the exhibition. We get out onto the gardener, and the bikes just start going. Well, we get to the Four Seasons before the fireworks are done. And Mick Jagger goes, oh, they do call you Fast Eddie for a reason. <laughs> we were at the hotel before the fireworks stopped. But that was probably one of the coolest rides I ever had. Like cops stopping the lights and the horses. It was like something from another world that nobody gets to do. Man. And we get to do it. Yeah, yeah 100%. Man. I'm loving this. Sorry, I'm just writing some things down. No, but that that's of stuff. Th those are the things that we get to do. Just as making a film, you know, that I could tell a funny story about that. When I did the Rolling Stones, I was doing a show called Nikita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And La Femme Nikita, Peter Wilson, one of the coolest chicks you ever met. She's down to heart. She's a good girl. You know, people talk shit about her, talk shit about her because she was cool and they're jealous of her. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. She was a down to earth, good person. We're still friends on Facebook. She wanted to blow my mind, so she phones me up and she says, come to my house. You have to come to my house right now. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, what's wrong? Her car's whatever, right? So I drive over and Mick Jagger's sitting on her couch. And she thinks that's going to blow my mind. And Mick Jagger looks and goes, <laughs> oh, Fast Eddie. That was it. Out of my house. She was pissed. <laughs> she didn't even want me to be there anymore. She thought it was going to blow my mind. And I walk in and Mick Jagger goes, oh, Fast Eddie. <laughs> that blew her mind. And this is the other thing that we should talk Brilliant. about because I have a plan. And because of this guy, John Rollins, and I met him, we're going to be talking to the Rolling Stones because he took the early pictures of the Rolling Stones. He knows them. He used to stay at George Harrison's house. This guy is like, he go, He was telling us, he goes, I slept in Elvis's bed. I go, was Elvis in there? And he goes, no. Yeah, they don't give a fuck. Right? Like, <laughs> and who cares, right? Unless it, gets, <clears throat> unless it gets greasy, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. So, so, <laughs> with, you, man. so with that... Uh, we go down. We go down the line, and we we learn all these things, as 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 you see this. But we've had unbelievable times doing what we've done, and that's what I said to this guy Rollins. I said, we've lived dreams that people don't get. So to film your rockumentary, I need money to do this because I'm not doing it half-assed. Right. If it's going to be done, it has to be done right. This yeah. guy has. He's got the picture of. of uh, of Elvis shooting that karate kick. You know that famous kick? Yeah. He took that picture. Oh, uh, true. Like, like, this guy's got pictures. He took pictures of Michael Jackson when he was still brown before he went white. You know what I mean? Like, he's got pictures that blow your mind. Like, yeah. and, and so to do this, I was like, no, I'm in. I'll direct this, no problem. And I've directed a few things now. I've directed a couple rock videos and a couple, I did a couple commercials. Very cool. Right? And it's like, uh, but I, as your dad will tell you, I'm the coordinator that stands on set watching the monitor. You know, when we were doing Resident Evil, it was really funny because people were running around, running around. And I didn't know Hartley at the time. And all okay. these guys were yelling. And I said to Scotty, I go, Scotty, can I organize the floor? He goes, why? I go, because this is madness. They want a light on and everybody's screaming and yelling. He goes, what? I go, put everybody on headsets put on a headset I said guys these first five cars that's A these five cars are B you're in charge of A you're in charge of B and I stood behind the monitor and the DP went that car there I go B4 turn the lights on bang the lights went on and Hartley went where has this guy been 
<laughs> and he goes, no, no, and you're not leaving set. You're doing this all day. Because up till then, it was like, that, not that car, that car. No, so, no, no, who, the who, one over from there. Who was originally in charge? ADs? Yeah. No, just, yeah. But it was the ADs and, and Scotty McGee, and Scotty was doing all the other stuff. So they were just yelling back and forth because that's how it goes until you put some organization to it. Like, I've got tricks that a lot of people don't know. When we did Top Cops, we had like 500 cars downtown that was supposed to look like New York. Well, they're not giving you 500 walkies. But the sound guy says to me, put the radio stations at this and I'll call the rolls and cuts. Oh, shit. Right? And if you're doing stunts and you got more cars than that, that's what you do. Oh, that's a wild way of doing it. But nobody knows that. Nobody knows that. Oh, that's crazy. Except us old guys. (laughs) (laughs) You old bastards. You old bastards. They ain't telling those tricks to the young guys. (laughs) You guys go figure that shit out later. (laughs) Radio? But this guy, um, John Reynolds, is pretty an amazing guy. I don't know how long he's going to be here for. How old old would he be now? in his 70s. Is he? But, you know, he's 70 years on the road. And where does he live? He lives in uh, London. Uh, England. London, Ontario. Oh, oh, really? Yeah. Like, and that's what I'm saying. This guy, and when you see his stuff, you're gonna go, Eddie. I wanna, I wanna meet him because he's such a cool cat, and he is that cool cat. Wow. You know the things he told me. Like he's been with every star that's anybody taking pictures of. He should you know, come up to old Bowman Sound and and uh, shoot it. Oh yeah, he's coming to it. Cool. He's coming to that. He's also gonna be at the Elvis thing, which you guys should come to the Elvis thing. Yeah. When is that? I don't know. We, we uh, yeah. Ron and I used to go up to. Uh, Collingwood, Collingwood oh, to, and hang know, out. It's twenty eight million dollars into the neighborhood. Yeah, there, yeah, and I, I've been no, up to it as well. It's my mom. Uh, my mom's been going. Now, mind you, you go there for three days to Collingwood, and one more person sings "How Great Thou Art." I'm gonna punch him in the oh, face. Far. Yeah. Right? No, no, that's how it gets. Yeah, yeah. that's how it gets. Every and it, too much of anything's not. I'm little, teasing, but too, it, too it, much else. Every venue, every venue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's how. That's how. But and see, now we're gonna talk about <clears throat> Bowman Sound. Yeah, I want to. How many people do you get? Uh, do we have a Pullman Sound? We get a couple hundred. Sweet, but, but they're Jeez. all film people, right? They're all people yeah. that you either know or you know somebody of. Totally, right? And it's really funny because there's all these little hobbits up there. Like we have our farm used to be like for horseback trails and that, so there's trails throughout the whole place. We have a big, we have an amphitheater, and we have a big like big park. I'll send you pictures because it, my place has turned into this, a bit of a monster. Sounds fucking stellar dude. it is and the funny part is you can always the little grip section i go look at you can tell they're all grips they all got no shirts on they all got brand new pickup trucks <laughs> and they all got atvs that's and, hilarious and no but you can see it like, <clears throat> and then you look over and you go and there's the wardrobe department because they all look kind of goofy and, shit, <laughs> and then you see the set dressers because their campsites are all decked out with like the lamps and shit you right? know and but it's so cool <laughs> that's hilarious you know and that's and it's only for us <laughs> It's only for the film business. And thing. you can tell that where the stunt guys are camping because two or three of them on fire. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Some of them are wearing, well, that's wearing funny pads. Thing, right? and... but it's, there's never been a beef at my... You know, I did security forever. So, yeah. And it's like there's no beef, right? There's no beef. That's there. interesting. So, 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 Sonny and Jake invited us when we were up on Wingman right. with Harley. Yeah, and I, I, did, uh, <coughs> I did karaoke with those boys up in... Uh, yeah, Saint I bet Graham. you did The Wait, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Yeah, of yeah, course. It was fantastic. One of my man. favorite songs. And I'm, yeah. I'm redoing The Wait with another soundtrack to it, which is actually really cool. Fucking A. Yeah, it's a Shaky Graves tune, and I'm okay. putting The Wait to it. Right on. It's actually, Really? Yeah. I'm, what do you yeah. mean? How do you do that? Well, I could show it to you. Yeah. You want to hear this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to laugh when you hear this. The Shaky Graves style is very cool, man. Shaky Graves is the is very is very cool in the way he does what he's doing, but this here. See, up at my farm, I have a bunch of friends that come over. <laughs> Hang on a sec. Hey, take your time. Listeners don't give a shit. No, it's about the music. <laughs> you guys can edit this anyways. <clears throat> but we won't. These, yeah. these... Oh, wow. How, how... We're doubling. Oh, so this, this is, is just your style. This yeah. is you kind of doing the, the mix of styles in the song. Yeah. That's a very unique way of playing this tune. 
Well, that and the thing was, I did this all recording it, driving home in my car with the car and the radio and my iPad and that. Oh, okay. And Gibby and Tom went, you know how crazy that is? <laughs> hey, how fast are you going? I go, oh, fuck 40. <laughs> <laughs> no distracted driving there, man. <clears throat> Just so you know, I hold the I hold the record from Toronto to Hamilton. Do you? <laughs> I do, from Park Lawn and Lakeshore to Hamilton City Hall. Okay. 15 minutes. Really? I don't even think you can do that now with traffic, unless well, you take the shoulder. There was traffic, and there was the shoulder moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did. I went, <laughs> I went by a cop at 285. What? I and he dry, just went, ah, fuck. He, his head went like this. Yeah. That was it. He wasn't sure he saw something. No, it was like a blur went by him. And I got to tell you, when you're driving, the white lines become solid. Yeah, oh yeah. And it's only because all the everybody said that they couldn't be done, so they put a camera over my shoulder. We're doing a show called Regenesis. And I was driving a Magnum SRT eight wagon. Oh yeah. It's like a NASCAR. Yeah. And I got on the ramp and I just hit it and I held it there the whole way to Hamilton. Came into the city That's a Ho Ford? It's Ford. No, no, it's Chrysler. Oh, oh yeah. Magnum oh. wagon with the right, right. SRT eight wicked yeah. car. Wicked yeah, I know what you're about. So I come into the parking lot sideways and I look at the camera and go, didn't lose a point. So now to get my money off to everybody that bet me that I couldn't do it in less than 25 minutes, and it was $3,000 they had to pay me. So we were, we're, in the, we're in the camera truck watching it, right? And they're trying to catch two songs. <laughs> and the producer comes in and he's watching it and he goes, holy shit, holy shit. Well, when did you do that, Eddie? I went, this morning. And he went, in a production car? I go, well, I didn't bring my car. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Man. All right. Challenge accepted. And, and I didn't get fired either. All right. <laughs> so that's where. So it, when's Bowman Sound? Son of a bitch. It's the long weekend in August. Uh, the Labor Day? Yeah, I don't know if it's the first long weekend in August. We're working that out. It's, oh, okay. We're doing a three-day weekend. That's because normally we do it on a two-day weekend. <clears throat> You know, we just said it Friday. Well, Friday night's the night to be there, to tell you the truth. The first night. Because all the bands, we do a live practice, like... Oh, yeah, and sweet. Then, and then we go and jam. And sweet. that's where the, the that's where you're going to see Fast Eddie and the Sweater Cats for the first time. All right. We're right gonna on. Play it there. There's a few songs. I'd like to I play. I'd you like, come and play. You if, can I, be a, if I just do an acoustic show or something. You could come and play with the Sweater Cats. Well, Jake's I'll already... I'll, yeah, I'll fuck around and play with anybody. Jake's already told you. Yeah. No, but that's what I'm saying though. With the, the, see, the sweater cats are wherever I am, with whichever members of any bands that I know become the sweater cats, right? Okay. And we're gonna do songs that they know. Right on. Okay. Right. I dig it. Right that's on. It. Right. All right. Well, that's like Janita said. Who gets broken down at 61 and starts a band? <laughs> uh, how, how how long do the bands go up and play? And do their gig well we've had some bands go up there like in rock the place i had paul james there one year and paul james is a friend of mine paul james paul james. Uh, boogie woogie extraordinaire like this guy oh, yeah. he played with the, he played with dylan played with everybody but this guy he does that rockabilly shit sweet like nobody else sweet. and best. we couldn't get anybody so i phoned him and he said i'm on my way and he and i had him and leah hawkins play and they blew the stage off and like since then we've had nothing but unreal people come and play and it's like last year um i do something that's really funny i'm the one and only lay down comedian i do this whole skit where i lay down and tell jokes <laughs> there's only a million fucking stand-up comedians yeah the that one was, only lay down and the first time i did it we were filming yeah. we were filming mayor, <laughs> we, were, lay down we were filming uh mayor of kingston and, uh, and i did this magical edible thing and oh then, yeah and i drank a little bit of whiskey and next thing you know i thought i was funny as fuck so i laid down and started filming it <laughs> it was like here's the lay down comedian why no nah, maybe i'll be the sit up no nah, i'm gonna be a laid down comedian and i tell jokes about the film business like you know there's a joke where it went down and this is a true story <laughs> you know everybody on a film such your friend right <clears throat> yeah unless your savage girlfriend phones you on speakerphone or on facetime and she's blindfolded and naked saying that she wants to get down with you and while i'm trying to do it the phone drops and lands on the table and everybody <laughs> starts shoving it around and all i want to do is hang the shit up and she's going i need this and i need that and i'm like shut up babe just, 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 shut up. and and it's like no no it's over there it's over there so I, I told the joke about that when I did the Lay Down Comedian, about <laughs> our business and the way it works. So that's kind of what the Lay Down Comedian does. Fucking right. Okay. It's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Is that going to happen Friday night? 
or Saturday. It'll happen Friday night at Bowman Sound. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. But the, the Friday night is the big fun. Trust me, bring a motor home, bring tents, do whatever, and come and spend the weekend. Yeah, you'll, I'll bring my motor home, man. I'm trip. telling you, you will love it. We have more fun there. <clears throat> and there's, you know, I, I said the first year that it went off, I went, oh, that was so cool. Because you'd go in the woods and you'd see like this whole little hobbit of like a group of five or six electrics, but it would be lit up. You know what I mean? It's like the pictures from our place will tell you that they're filmmakers. Do you ever document this? At all? Like, do you, nope. you film it? We have yeah. lots of film. We have lots of yeah. pictures. Yeah, record. You should, kind of you should have a documentary about this. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's eventually we'll do that, you know. And one of the things I'm trying to do right now, and, and by this guy, John Reynolds, that I've met, and I'll tell you this because it's been a while since my granddaughter had her stomach flipped and they took her into sick kids. And uh, uh -huh. you've never been scared. Like, your kid gets hurt, that's one thing. But your kid's kid gets hurt, yeah. Now you're freaked out about both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And I right. went there, and it's like my son's son, he's a sweetheart. <clears throat> and uh, sick kids fixed her. Now, I'll tell you, going back to when I was doing the steel wheels thing, we were driving up University, and Mick Jagger said, it's got the wrong name. If you wanted to use the right affirmation, it should be fixed kids. So I'm going to make it a thing where I'm going to try to change totally, it. Totally, dude. From, yeah, wow. from sick kids to fit kids. Fix where, kids, yeah. Where there's a door that they come in and it's called sick kids. But when they leave, they leave out the fixed kids door. And it's going to be a huge Aww. thing that I get where I want to put a train <clears throat> that goes around the building. And when the train gets to the roof, you've raised a billion dollars to make it even a better hospital than it is. It's hands down the best hospital for kids in the world. So... Maybe if we, between all the corporate people and everything that we do, we raise a billion dollars to tear the roof off and make it that much better. It'll be because Mick Jagger said it driving up university and that I'm going to do it because they saved my granddaughter. Wow. And it was funny because when all that shit went down, I'm on set freaking out about some of my granddaughters, this, that. And uh, everybody came up and told me a story of their cousin's daughter who got fixed or, or their kid's but the kid did something and they had to take him there. Like, there's not anybody that hasn't been touched by saying, by sick kids. Mm -hmm. There's somebody you know within an arm's length yep. that has had... I, I, I've known a few mothers that have had to deal with, uh, what you know, whatever months in sick kids. Like, um, like, and they are absolutely... Uh, uh, I mean, there's nothing but... Pure positivity coming but out. But that's of that what place. I'm saying. And so that you know, like for the last 35 years, I've, I've 30 years, I've done uh, Variety Village, the world's greatest Christmas party. I've produced it for handicapped kids, actually special need kids. Mm -hmm. They've changed it. Yeah. And I and I need to know that, and I need to say that it's, it's special needs. But we've been doing it for 30 years. Like my kids went there as kids, and then they ended up being the guys that rigged it and tear it down. And I got the firemen involved. We have 3,000 kids go through our our venue every year. What's it called? Variety Village, the world's gre world's greatest Christmas party. And I've had all the stars and all those people come out, and my kids rig it, and all that stuff goes down. But it's it's an amazing thing that, I, you know, when they first interviewed me about it, they said, why do you do it? And I go, well, I've got three kids that I worry about banging into things. These kids, you worry about them getting a cold because they're going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a funny stunt story to this that you're going to laugh your head off. So then the second, about three years later, they asked me again, and I went, have you ever met somebody with special needs parents? Why? Because, you know, this girl's 30. She's totally gray-haired. She doesn't have a day off. The only place that she gets a break is at Variety Village. Right, she takes her special needs child there and knows that she's in, that child is in good enough hands that they can go have a two minute break and have a coffee mm -hmm. because they're on twenty four seven. And then the last time they asked me, which was like ten years ago, I said I do it for me. I feel good about myself. Well, I need another cause, and I think sick kids is going to be part of that cause. Wow, man, good for you. You know, we're listen. I'm I'm a blessed person. You know, I came from a, I was the seventh son in a poor Irish family in the junction, which nine out of 10 of my friends went to jail or died. And I got in the film business and I got into the film family. And I started working for Gross with Jacobson, which paid all of us for a real long yeah, time. Yeah, big time. Like Larry and Sid, they were the first guys on Night Heat to give out Parkas. They took care of you. 
and they made you like family. I remember we were down at the Nut House and producer comes in and they're doing a show and there he goes, well, Eddie, I'll be your transport coordinator. And they go, well, Eddie's on that show. And they went, yeah, and he'll be on your show too. He goes, what do you mean? No, Eddie's our guy. And the guy goes, well, how's he going to do both shows? He goes, because you're both going to pay him because Eddie does all our shows. That's how this works. And they didn't, they never hesitated. They, if you were with them, you were with them. That that part of producing has gone out the window. They love you for as long as they love you, and then what? yeah, that's yeah. that's something about the need. film industry that I actually wish there was more of. Well, you know, well, so Jacobson, where that where you were a family, you were part of a family. Mm -hmm. You actually felt it when Sonny Senior or Larry Senior, Rick, he knew who everybody was. You know, it was a different world back then. Yeah, indeed it was. So. I'm on I'm on the outside looking in at it now, and I'm kind of glad because it's kind of gotten corporate-y. Well, the film you, business has got more corporate. All, all, all the guys in your age group say this. They all say this exact <clears throat> thing. Yeah, the sad part is that you guys didn't see the camaraderie of it all. You guys seen a little bit of it? You know, when you were out of town and you went singing with my sons? Yeah. That would have been downtown on Queen Street if you were shooting there. Yeah. And like I'm now, with... you finish on Queen Street, you get in your car and you go home. Yeah, it's true. Back then, we would go to Free Fall. We would go to Wally Magoo's. Everybody would go to somewhere, you know. Yeah. See, that's the thing too. Is I, I like I live out here, and I don't. I never did the living in Toronto thing. Um, <clears throat> and I, I like to just get in my car and come home. And to be honest, like while there's obviously I got tons of friends in the film industry, but if I go to a party or I go to a little thing, it's it, it doesn't feel like we're talking about work. It feels like we're talking about how we can all get each other more work or right. something like that. Yeah, it's right. a bit. It's just uh. It's always tug and pull now, you know. And it's it, yeah. I kind of I no, feel like the camaraderie days are a little bit uh, faded. You're one hundred percent. Back then in the day, it was a, that and not only that. We, yeah, I mean, good. there's moments. Yeah, there's moments. Yeah, moments, of Absolutely. course, of I'm course. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Of and there's, there's <clears throat> especially you feel it when you're out of town on a show. If you're out of yes. town on a show, yes. then you feel like you meet everybody in the hotel downstairs. You have a drink. You have dinner with them. Yep. Yeah. So when you're out of town, like nowadays, I take shows that are out of town. I live at the farm, so if I get Resident Evil, they put me up in Sudbury. Put me up in a nice hotel. Right. I stay yeah, there and, I, and it's better yep. to do your job that way. Coming down to Toronto is a bit of a drag, but you know what? I do it because the friends that I work with are buddies. I don't really need to work for the. I shouldn't say I don't need the money because I do, but I don't. Cause yeah, money, I get you. No, yeah. money doesn't mean shit to me. It took mm -hmm. me a long time. I, you know, Randy will tell you, I owned every truck in the film business. You know, all the honey wagons in here makeups? Yeah, man. I owned them all at first. They were all black and purple, and, and I owned them all. I was the first guy to build hair, makeups, and wardrobes in that. And now I look at it as, uh, it's just, it's, it's, money is, you need it to get by. You have too much of it, you get friends you don't want. And, and you get jealousy. Like when I, you know, you gotta realize, <clears throat> I was 26 years old, coordinating the biggest show in the, in the city, which was War of the Worlds at the time. Mm -hmm. And I had a 911 Porsche. Do you know how many people hated me for that? <clears throat> like I was 26 years old and I'd come flying up in my Porsche park it sideways to get out and go alright I need this 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 and that done well if you're over 40 you hate me right and if you're a coordinator that you think I you should be doing the job I'm doing you really hate me so I went through a lot of, in my in this business you will find two kinds of people in this business ones that love Eddie Bowman and the ones that hate me and the ones that hate me are usually because I don't give a shit about what they think that's the truth Totally, man. Did I diss anybody there? No, I not, didn't. No, this, I, I know. This, I was hoping was I would. That wasn't a general diss. I was hoping. <laughs> but we can always go back to Stephen Steen. I'm not saying nothing about him, but yeah, just toss him, <laughs> toss him under the truck one more time. Yeah. <laughs> War of the Worlds, Jesus! If Top Cops was 35 years ago, War of the Girl, War of the Worlds was exactly no, it's 35, and Top Cops is 32. Jake's 32 years old. Dylan's 35. Copy, okay. I, I, I remember Dylan. Top Cops yeah. in my life, and I was probably three years old. Yeah. yeah. Four years old. I don't but that's remember, what I'm remember, saying. But, but that, that was a big part of my, you know, that's five years of my life. Yeah. And we worked around the clock on that show. It was a nonstop. I always tell people, if you did that show, the rest is easy. Like, the rest is easy. Like, mm -hmm. when they go, oh, we got this huge feature, I always go... 
I always go, there's no big feature. <laughs> Features are easy. You get all the planning. For me, Mayor Kingston was the retarded show. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not supposed to say retard. Sorry. Yeah. Unless you're retarding the engine, right? Yeah. So it was That's same, what you it, meant, it, though. It was that kind of retard. Yeah. It was like yeah, retarding the engine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that car, like that show, Mary Kingston, was old school madness. Yeah. Like, oh, we're going to Kingston tomorrow. But, you know, they paid us. <laughs> she did have that vibe to it. They, they, it they, yeah. they paid us because, uh, like, I was making $8,000 a week every week, right? But I was working seven days a week for seven months. Yeah. Like, and at the end of that show, I was, I was actually sick. I went up to the farm and I slept for like a week. I believe it. And uh, and uh, if you ask me if I ever want to do it again, I would say no. Really? Yeah. No, no. I you know, I don't need to work that hard on anything ever again like that. I'm I'm a coordinator that gives a shit. Like um a lot of coordinators you never see them on set. I'm on set. When shit's going on on set, I'm standing there. You know, uh Hartley Gornstein once told a guy, "Well, you know, you can always Eddie will have his perch." And if you have a problem with Eddie, and you call for transport, the Suburban will come off the perch, drive down right onto set, and he goes, and when I say right onto set, I mean right onto set, where they're shooting, and I get out and I say, what do you need? And, and I make it happen. Where other coordinators sit in the office, in the, and they're not like, it's, it's like, you know, stunt guys that are just doing the paperwork. They're, yeah. not, doing, they're not there to make sure what's going on. It's <clears throat> changed. Yeah, it takes me forever to do the paperwork, man. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Uh, we know it. We know yeah, it. I don't well. want to read that. Yeah, show. no, but that you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I watched that show the other day, uh, one of your podcasts. Because before I came here, the one where the guy talked about that stunt guy getting hurt, and he talked about Bullethead stepping off the car. Steve, and dying. Steve Chase. No, I think he was a director Steve. of some kind. Yeah, it might have been Steve. He was uh, talking about how they did the, the Xbox stunt and the, the Xbox. Yeah, right? the Xbox. And oh, the guy, and uh, the guy got hurt. Steve. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Steve, yeah. No, and the guy got hurt, and I went, yeah, those things happen because you let somebody not knowing what they're doing do that job. Yeah. If you were doing it or Bronco was doing it or Marco was doing it, that would have never happened. True enough. Because you guys have got, and the same as me. Do you know how many accidents? This is something, and I'm going to say this, and I never put it out there. 40 years of film work, 40 years of being a tractor-trailer driver, honey wagon driver, car driver, going from set to set faster than anybody else no accidents on set ever right on man right, that's man. 40 years and trust me i tried i tried to get it in. <laughs> yeah you told us the one story <laughs> <laughs> exactly no, no, no good for you man that's wicked right yeah. yeah so but there's guys that you know that work in our business that have 14 accidents and mm -hmm. it's like what the hell well the weird thing is is like uh you know i've been uh, around and knowing guys like you because coming from my pops sort of era um, and not a lot of guys brag about this kind of stuff anymore like the guys in my it's sort of in my era my uh, era or group they don't brag about these safety things or these kinds of things it's it's, uh, it's different kind of shit right you know I don't know does that make sense Maybe I'm not making any sense. No, no, any it makes point, sense. I, but I, I think you do. It's like, it's, yeah, it's just, it, you can just tell that times have changed. Guys like you talk about this kind of stuff. And, uh, well, we, we, we set the road. There was, no, there, there was no pattern to doing what we did. Mm -hmm. Like there was nobody, to, you learned from this guy and this guy and this guy, how do you do your job? To this day, there is no manual on how to be a transport coordinator. There's no book that says you get up and you start your day by going in and making sure these things are all done. You know, yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's nobody that says this is how you park a unit. I did it, and those days are over. I, I've I've given up teaching people shit because it always like you know, I taught a lot of people how to do their jobs, and then they you know they go out and they tell you how it's done. And well, you learn that because you watched us. Ah, uh, totally. What I agree with truck? that. Uh, a 56 I got a 55 Chevy eh? oh do you oh yeah but 427 small block oh will it be at uh, Bowman Sound it's always at my farm oh, I gotta drive my pickup up trust me you do you yeah. do cause this is, you're gonna come we put in an $80,000 road to get back to where we do this you know I remember when Jake said it 
Jeez. It was probably more than 80 because he told me it was 80, so it was probably like 115, <laughs> right? But uh, in film, the budget was 80, Dad. And, yeah, we went over. So, uh, but, we, you know, when we first did it, because we have a talk, me, Jake, and Dylan, we talk about a lot of things. And when he first said it, I was like, oh, man, that's a lot of dough. It's a dirt road back there. Best thing we ever did, because then we got all the trucks back there. We got buses back there. I've got four double-decker English buses that I'm going to turn into bunkies. Oh, trip. So the upstairs will be Good a bedroom. Idea. The be bottom will be a little kitchenette. We're building a recording studio there so that you come and record in the middle of nowhere. And at the big end of the day, what I would like it to be is that Bowman Sound is a place where you bring musicians. They come there. They learn how to play on the stage in front of people. They go into the recording, and we give them an album from the middle of nowhere that we make and they stay on buses, like we have Ronnie's bus, we have a bunch of buses, you know? That's kind of what we'd like to see happen. Well, that sounds great. Sounds that, that's badass. And we have a musician here that will come up and record. There you go. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm a big music freak, man. Well, you can come and hang out and be part of the Sweater Cats when we're singing. Sweet, love it. Right? The Sweater Cats are the guys that just come Depends on who you are, when at time. It's Fast Eddie and the Sweater Cats, and it can be 15 people on the stage. I'll send you some of, it. I'll send you some of his music. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I've been playing guitar for um, 25 going on years. Right. And, uh, yeah. I'll that's just, a, that's the one regret I have I it, in life, is that I didn't get Jimmy Page to sign a guitar to me. Mm. I could have. Me and Jimmy hung out, right? I could have went, can you sign that? And I, and I didn't even think to do it. Right, but at this point in my life, I have a I have a basketball from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Wow. To Fast Eddie, right? Oh so man, for right me on. To do that with um, to do that with Jimmy Page would have been a trip. Now where yeah. did, where did you meet Kareem? Would that be on? I a did TV a show. Series? We did a TV series. M um, Matrix. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, oh really? I stunted with him. Yeah. <laughs> it was very cool. Yeah, I imagine but, you doubled him. Y yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I remember. I was in the hair and makeup trailer, and I'm standing, and he's sitting on a chair. Yeah, he's and, and we were eye to eye. Was yeah. <laughs> and the weird part was we had a minivan, and we took out the middle seat. Yeah. His legs were up by where the engine is, and he sat in the back seat kind of like this. Yeah. Like that, he's like, he's a man. man tall, but a good guy. That's crazy. No, he's a great guy. His, his we, wife uh, was only about this tall, which really made me laugh. <laughs> Come over here. Let me put yeah, this Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we spoke at length about Bruce Lee and training with Bruce Lee. It was fun. Yeah, no, he's a oh, very cool, cool cat. But Randall went out and got basketballs. Bring your mic and up. And he signed them all. Bring your mic up. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You can, you can. No, no, I get it. Um, For sure. We had them all signed, which, you know, the only thing is I wish I would have got Jimmy Page to sign a guitar for Yeah. Me. Yeah, that would have been fucking. But if they come back, badass. I will do it. If he's back in Toronto, I'll go find him. And... Really? Oh, yeah. Does he tour? Is he touring? They tour. They're trying to tour right now. And if they come to Toronto, as or, Zeppelin, uh, well, they it's Jimmy Page and Robert Plant. Okay, right. Yeah. But uh, my wife was a huge Robert Plant fan. Are you kidding? Every woman loved Robert Plant. But yeah. you know that's why he got the band. He came and sang. It was Jimmy Page's <laughs> was the, was the musician, and uh, he hired everybody in the band. He hired John Bonham and but you know they had a lot of people come and do. Uh, when he came and just the sex appeal and that he had, he, they went, you're in. So, you know, Robert Plant, come on, man. Yeah, man. The guy's a killer. Yeah. Yeah, he is a killer. Yeah. So what was it like hanging with these guys? With those guys? Yeah. It was cool as hell, man. What'd they do? Well, well they, you, know? you know what we took? Listen, when you're a driver, you take them to the hotel, you go to green rooms. Yeah, you do all that kind of security. They're, by the time you take them to the room, you hang out, and that guy takes over for security. But it's, they got pretty busy lives when they're there. You know, they got to go to these things, and you're constantly totally. taking them places. Yeah. You know? Okay. They got to meet they meet and greet this person, meet and greet that person. Yeah. You know? What a life, eh? Oh, man. Like, I'll tell you, I would never want it. Like, fame is one thing. Super fame is crazy. Yeah. Like, Mick Jagger, when I took him, we went to the Moscow Circus. And now, Mick Jagger has a bodyguard named Rowan, and Rowan is an MI6 guy. Mm -hmm. Wow, James Bond. Yeah, and he's with Mick Jagger twenty four seven. Somebody steps to Mick Jagger, they're gonna wish they didn't. This is that guy that takes you out with his baby finger, and uh, very cool man. So we went to the Moscow Circus. We go in there. We got his kids, and it was the weirdest feeling ever. 
There's lions and tigers jumping through fire and shit, and nobody's watching the show. They're just staring at us. Oh, wow. The whole time. <clears throat> you know how weird that is? Yeah. It's weird. Like, if I glance at you and I see you and, and I kind of stare at you for a minute, it's one thing. If I just... Yeah. Like, and like, dot, they're like, yeah, you, start, the you start to wonder what's on your face. Yeah, or, no, no, but I was one of these for sure because everybody <laughs> was looking at us. Yeah, yeah. Like, everybody in the whole place, the Moscow Circus, they didn't watch the circus while we were there. They watched us. Man, that's so fuck. That's so freaky. It's creepy. Yeah, yeah. And I'm yeah. not going to lie. But so, every big star you've ever seen, they have some of that. Don't get me wrong. The Rolling Stones, they're on the other side of that. Mm -hmm. Like, Mujago gets out and starts running. Around Queen's Flirt Circle. Now realize he's got a toque on, a scarf, big sunglasses, <laughs> and within two laps of the thing, he's got people chasing him. Wow. And you'd be like, what? They 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 noticed your lips. You know what I mean? <laughs> so where do, do they? Does someone like Mick Jagger ever find solitude in his day? Like, does he get a moment? I don't. You know, I mean, I'm sure he does, but I'm sure that it's in Mystique or somewhere. It's somewhere in an island somewhere. Like, because mm. I'll tell you, when yeah. they're on the road, there's a constant everything going on. And Mick Jagger's the kind of guy who goes up on the deck and makes sure it's all screwed down. He's a, like he doesn't mess around. That guy's a very smart individual. That's why he is who he is. Exactly. Yeah, man. And I always hear stuff about guys like with that super fame. Yeah. You go, okay, well, it's Mick Jagger, you know, and he's he's great vocalist. He's part of the Rolling Stones. Well, you go, yeah, but I think the reason is is that they they're on time. They do their job. They look at things. They look around at who's there. They Mick Jagger people, runs. They the, the Mick Jagger runs the deal. Yeah, right on. Right from the floor to the get go. Right on, man. That's someone who gives a shit. Yeah, that's about what somebody he's doing. knows what he's doing and he does it. Yeah. So being in the film business, you must have driven a ton of movie stars. I mean, people ask me all the time who I worked with. God, I have to look at my resume just to. Yeah, no, and that's that's what I mean. It's a dream most of the time, and I, and I got to tell you, some of the guys like you know Michael Bean, the guy from Terminator, oh, awesome yeah. guy. Yeah. I hung out with him, and an actor came to to do Saw. And he goes, Fast Eddie. And I go, how do you know me? And he goes, I'm a friend of Michael Beans. He has a picture of you and him on his mantelpiece. No shit. <laughs> and, right? And it's like, but I've had unbelievably great times with unbelievably cool people. Like, I've got I've got some Facebook stuff from Tom Sizemore. Yeah. Because I did a movie with him. And I thought he was a way underrated actor. The guy was a machine. And yeah, he had a drug problem. Who doesn't at times? You know what I mean? But like he said, when he was doing, when he was doing um, Saving Private Ryan, he says, Eddie, I'm in the trailer doing blasts. And Steven Spielberg's going, yeah, that's the look, that intense look in your eyes. He goes, yeah, fuck, I was wired. Right? <laughs> but that, but that you're going, getting off a, a boat, uh, you're going to have that same look, like you're wired. In World War II, getting off that boat, going in there. So to a director, yeah, that's the look I'm looking for, that holy shit i'm crazed yeah well it's the 14 lines you did before the show but <laughs> you you got the look right <laughs> that's the end of that story <laughs> yeah oh, cocaine was in the film business <laughs> oh this, was it only for this brief moment but boy it was a snowstorm <laughs> Snow yeah, stuff. the 80s. The 80s, <laughs> 90s. Oh, that's a good line. No, no. Line. Yesterday. It was a snowstorm back then. <laughs> when we did the fly, it was really funny because we've been up for like three and a half days and uh, just fired up. And they said, Eddie, can you drive Dr. Waxman down to the city? And I went, no. <laughs> Why? I go, no. Nah, he, he, he won't let me drive him. And he'll try to whack me with a couple of volumes. He goes, well, can you drive Jennifer Dale? And I went, absolutely. She's an actress. She won't even notice I'm fucked. <laughs> She's fucked too. No, 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 I won't. no, no, that's true. That actress, she got in the car, started chatting about herself <laughs> all the way down to the city. <laughs> right? But that that's the truth. Our lives have changed. And it's a good thing that the snowstorm left the film industry because, you know, a lot of us didn't get home at times. Yeah, uh, yeah. For days. No, I get it. You know? I get it. What was that saying? If I just go to sleep now, I can get 40 minutes sleep. But what's better, not making it home or getting all the stories for later, for times like this? Well, I've been fortunate. I get to do both. Yeah, that's right? true. I lived, true. The, I lived the life of a rock star, <coughs> never picking up a guitar. But for my 60th birthday, my kids bought me a beautiful purple Gretsch. 
They bought me a beautiful guitar. I still haven't learned how to play it. Now, where do you? Where, where's that guitar? It's in everything I own is in Owen Sound. It, it is. It's okay. at the middle of nowhere. You're gonna make it there, bud. Because <clears throat> you're not getting a hind lift. <laughs> your dad's closer. <laughs> you, you choke it on the water. <clears throat> Try some of that whiskey. That'll be you, you know what that is? It's homemade vodka. You want some? No. It's uh, it's homemade vodka, <laughs> Ukrainian starts, vodka. Ukrainian vodka. Yeah. It's that color. Oh man. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's I'm actually quite choking tasty. on absolutely nothing. There you go. <coughs> okay. Excuse me, guys. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's Ukrainian vodka. It's got some flavor too. I believe it. Yeah, it's I'm okay. Fifty-five. Oh, it's dude. still All early. Right. Yeah. I'd, I'd need a couple lines to get into the booze this early. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on now? What's going on well, today? Well, today I'm going back to the farm because maple syrup's about to pour from the trees again with the warm. Right. We've mm -hmm. had three spouts of it. See, what happens is you get maple syrup the minute the temperature drops to this. Yeah. It's the trees start leaking. Right. And... uh that's something we do up in the middle of nowhere is we try to get as much maple syrup as we can. We grow Now, is this just you yeah. you 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 move up there and you got to take advantage. Well, the whole plan is that Jake and I and a few of us believe that the world's going to go for a big shit in the next 5 to 10 years. Yeah, I'm with you. I on truly that. believe that. I think that everything, the covid, everything is leading up to this. I don't I, and you know when you'll know with is, you. is when the internet drops. Yeah, when the internet drops, that's when you got to buckle. Yeah, and I up. think that's coming sooner than yeah, later. Yeah, but probably. when that happens, Maybe. we need to we'll buckle see. down. So the farm is going to be self-sustained. We'll be able to live up there. Syrup up for there. days. No, no, but we're going to have food. We're, we're growing. I put in 300 things of garlic. We're, we're slowly getting to learn. I'm not a farmer. Yeah, Jake was telling us that you were doing this. Yeah, and it's like, the funny part is, while I'm doing it, I'm like, this is mental. What the frig am I doing? And then yeah. afterwards, I go, it's kind of cool. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like I planted all the garlic, and when it comes out... Fucking A. Right? I think that's sick. And yeah. we did like this big garden thing last year that was amazing, and uh, we got way more fruits and vegetables than we thought we would have. Do you, you struggle with uh, wildlife? Uh, we have wildlife up there, but they're deers, the odd coyote. But, you know, they don't go after the food. Okay. You know, right now we got chipmunks going after the plastic bags with <clears throat> maple syrup. So we put them in, into garbage cans. How, how does that work? Well, because usually you tap in and there's a bag that hangs off the Oh, floor. I see. A little squirrel eats off the end of it and it gets all the syrup. Oh, fuck. Okay. Right? So we were losing that. But, we, we've, we've, you know, you adapt. You know, it's one of those things. We've, we've, I haven't been a farmer my whole life, but, you know, it's pretty basic stuff. You know, when you when they do it, like even when I put in the garlic, you just you have to. You, the best part is, I say the internet's going to be gone, but if you want to do something, you look on the internet, it shows you exactly how to do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, that's you what better get those how tos down before the internet goes exactly. down. Exactly. And I said to somebody, get all your favorite <clears throat> movies on a key, so you can stick it in your computer because that's all you're going to get yeah. someday. I truly that's believe. The truth. I truly believe that they don't want everybody talking the way they do. Yeah. Okay. So they are going to shut it down. And there will be a work internet, there will be an army, and there will be a, a government internet. But it won't be a worldwide web that you can say whatever the fuck you want on. They're going to shut that down. Too many people can put their point of view of where a lot of people end up hearing your point of view. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, and they don't want that. <clears throat> Censorship certainly they is do. a thing that's going on that's, huge right if now. If you don't believe for one minute that we're living in a communist country, you're crazy. But we have some pretty strong people on the other side trying to fight for this shit, and let's hope that that's, uh, let's that hope continues they, to grow. Let's hope they win. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you something. When I found out my son Dylan went to Florida and couldn't go to a gun range and shoot because he's Canadian. What? Yeah. Really? Trudeau did a deal with uh, the states without talking to anybody that you can't shoot guns in the states if you're a Canadian anymore. When did that happen? Exactly. No, that that's the point right there. They did it without anybody knowing. So that what a, what a, we're living in a communist world here. When the government can just do anything without talking to anybody and put those things in play, <clears throat> you're living in a communist world. And Trudeau went to the States and said, you guys can't have Canadians down there buying guns or shooting them in your gun shops. It's hard to believe that that had happened in Florida. 
This is obviously a federal thing. It's but. across the, all of the U.S. You can't go to any gun ranges in the States if you're a Canadian now. Can a Canadian hunt? No, not in the States. No, no, you're not allowed to have guns down there. They're not letting Canadians know how to shoot guns down there. They're not letting you practice. So I can't go down to Arizona and blow some shit up anymore. Well, hey, you know what? If you got a friend that lives in Arizona and lets you do it on their property. Yeah, yeah right. But right. if you think you're going to a gun range in Arizona, no. And when Dylan was telling me, I went, I didn't hear anything about that. And then I realized, no, we didn't hear anything about that because they're just dictating to us. I have an American handgun license. But that's what I'm saying. But you're Canadian, so how's that going to work? Because Dylan, Dylan has all his licenses from the States and everything. Like when he went to UCLA, yeah, he used to go shooting all of the... Dylan likes to shoot guns. Yeah. So he'd go to the range and let off. He went to do it in Florida, and they went, no, nah, that's over. You Canadians can't shoot here anymore. When, go, when was that? Back. When did... Last, win last, last winter. Wow. Yo, fuck, man. I got some questions for some people. Yeah. That's... No, but that's what I'm saying. And so when they start doing that, the more they do that, where they do things behind your back... Those are things that aren't allowed to be. And you know why they're doing that, right? They don't want any Canadians knowing how to arm themselves. Of course. Yeah, of yeah. Course. That's, that's the whole... Because they're doing corrupt things. That's the whole thing about taking guns away. But, and I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> you know where it comes from? Trudeau's dad was Castro, if you like it or not. Yeah. Pierre Elliott Trudeau... Honestly? Pierre Elliott Trudeau looked like Mr. Burns from the Yeah, season. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. He he legit looks like fucking Castro. Exactly, like it is Castro. really hilarious. Come on, bud. You, you can't I mean. have Mr. Burns as your dad, and then you come out as this macho guy that looks Cuban. Yeah, whether it's truth or not, I mean, he's not doing any. He's not helping the cause. Okay, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Why else would you bring a brand new baby down to see a dictator in Cuba and let him hold him up like this in front of people? Why would you do that? Hmm. This. Exactly. Yeah. Nobody can answer that question for you. <laughs> <laughs> right? And it's funny because Margaret stayed in Cuba for like weeks when Trudeau came back for work. Hello. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's kind of, and it's it's shit for, <clears throat> for the son. Trudeau, you, you should have went with your dad there. And even Castro's other son in, in Cuba says that it's his Canadian brother. So really? Yeah. Oh, there, there's been that shit go down. <laughs> now, if that's the case, the guy that's running our country right now, yeah, is from the loins of Fidel Castro, who was a communist. Yeah, so, time. what do you think comes down the line? Mm -hmm. Your dad's a stuntman, right? Yeah, you're a stuntman, right? Yeah, oh yeah, yo, I'm putting it together right now, <laughs> man. As, <laughs> well, what else has to be said? I'm saying, I'm thinking the same thing. Uh, well, that's and, you it's know, easy. this. Uh, yeah, I grew up trying to make my dad proud. I imagine. Yeah, I was and, doing the same. And then thing. he's working with uh, that other idiot, that Klaus Schwab guy. Yeah, he's part of all that. But it, but you know what I always say about that is, show me somebody that we could put in there and back, and I would back him. Yeah, me too. That's the problem. There's nobody to back them. There's nobody to back here. Like, there's no great person that we could go. This guy, we should put everybody behind him and make him change. Make him the changer. Yeah. Right. Change the game with that. It's never going to happen. And and you can't even blame Trudeau because he's got a group of people that tell him what to do. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that that's the drag. He's just a walking dummy. Well, yeah. they're they're all they're all people that are told what to do they're puppets i don't care who they are you sure know? and things have been changing for a number of years and uh the, the train is on the track and it's moving fast yeah and you know you can step in front of it all you like yeah man it's still coming yeah uh -huh. and they don't got no brakes mm -hmm. they're going down that road and the thing is that's what that, it sounds like yeah no the only good thing about everything that i think that's <clears throat> going on in this world is i think toronto and canada itself is going to be fine the states is going to fall into itself, which it already is. You got to realize half the states, New Orleans, Florida. There's a funny show you should watch. It's called When the Floods Come with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay, yeah, I've heard Leonardo, of it. Leonardo DiCaprio is walking along and he has a one little spot where you watch this. But when he's talking to Obama, listen to what Obama says. Cause oh, yeah? DiCaprio throughout the movie goes, I'm just an actor, but it doesn't look right to me. Like, this doesn't look right to me. Like, all this shit doesn't look right to me. And I'm only an actor. I'm not a scientist. I'm not 
Mm-hmm. But to me, global warming looks like it's messed up. So he asks Obama, and Obama says, and you got to watch it because it's only a two-second thing. He goes, so what would you like me to do? Tell all the people with water frontage that their property's not worth anything? As a president, that means everybody in Florida, everybody along Nantucket, they're yeah. all done. New Zealand's disappearing right now down in the Caribbean that have been here for hundreds of years that are disappearing. The water's coming up. Toronto, 750 feet above sea level. We're all good there. And I do believe New York is going to be 12 feet underwater one day. It's going to look like Venice. It is. They already know it. That's why when shit happens, they didn't fix the subways in New York when they got flooded out because they know it's going to happen again. Same with New Orleans. Same with Florida. Florida put in some $10 million pump that pumps the water from the streets back out into the ocean. But where the fuck's the water coming from? No, no, but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. They pump it from the streets back out of the ocean, but it's coming from the ocean. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a little fucking weird. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And they spend millions of dollars to do that. Yeah. Hmm. You know, and and where I used to go, uh, when I first met Jenny, this is 35 years ago, we'd go to the Keys, we'd drive straight down and and stay at the Keys because... Well, we used to be able to drive our car and walk around, like kind of like Sobble Beach. The water's right up against the road now. The mm. beach is gone. The beach was 350 feet. So uh, you, you have to be ignorant to not see what's really happening here. Right. Right? And, and nobody's really <clears throat> taking charge of it. Like global warming, Clinton knew what was going on, and he, he kind of went, you know, there's a bunch of presidents that haven't done it. All the stuff that they're talking about is real. And DiCaprio, the other part is there, there's a really good part is he's up in the Arctic. And the guy said, you know, if you just take ice and put it in a cup, it'll last for hours. And then you pour a little water in there, that ice starts to do that. Well, they've got all water going underneath <clears throat> all the all the glaciers. They've got rivers that are running through the bottom of these glaciers. So there's this thing where the hose, the lines are out, and the guy, DiCaprio goes, so that line, he says, what is that? And he goes, well, that's the line that went down from the water to the ice, and and he went, so that much ice has melted that you've had to pull that much line out? And he goes, yeah, and he goes, here's the actor for you. Well, where? Like, where did it melt? And he goes, all of it. Like, this whole glacier's melted, 50, 60 feet, okay? Yeah, it doesn't do it in It doesn't do it in spots. That's what I laughed because he's an actor. He went, well, where's it melting? All of it. (laughs) Like all of it for miles. If you haven't watched that show, you need to watch it. Yeah, yeah, I'll take a look. And I'll tell you. When the flood comes. But you got to listen when it, and it's only a split second when you hear Obama because he says, what am I supposed to do? Tell people with waterfront property they're shit out of luck? Hmm. Your property's not going to be worth shit in five years. So what, it's coming. So what's their answer? All these hmm. carbon taxes and... Well, the carbon taxes are a good idea. But what I think is that they should actually, you know... Like I used to always laugh. They used to... Tornado Alley. They call it Tornado Alley. They put up housing in there, but trailer parks. Yeah. Come on, man. You <laughs> put mobile homes in a place they call Tornado Alley? What do you think's going to happen? Right, that's the end of the line. What do you think is really going to happen there? So if you know that and you plan for that, we're smart enough to go like this: put your houses on high ground, mm-hmm. put your houses, and and know what? Start filling your lakes with fresh fish, and start taking care of things that are going to mean something in ten years from now, or twenty years from now. You know what I mean? Build forests around where the water could come in. Put like put in dams. They, they're not doing anything. That's that's the crazy part. They're, everybody's living in their life like nothing's wrong. We're all good. When really all the world, all the world people, like, you, you know, um, there's a group of seven or a group of 11 people that are the billionaires in this world. Mm-hmm. They really need to sit down and go, guess what? We need to stop worrying about making money. Yeah. And worry about having a place to stay. Okay, that's the truth. And the minute we start thinking about where we should stay, we'll have a place to stay. Till then, 
I'm not. It's not looking so shiny. Well, a lot of the people there, they don't care about us down here, do you? They don't care about anybody but themselves. That's the yeah. problem with the world today, yeah. is that people care about themselves and not the That's community. Right. That's right. I think that what you got to understand is, and, and, and my farm, the middle of nowhere, is based on this. Someday down the road, we're going to go back to being tribal. But they're not going to be, it's going to be family tri, it's going to be family tribal with people that we care about. You know, the people that you see at Bowman Sound will be the people that would be willing that I would let come to my farm if they needed to. Then you become a tribe sure. then, and you start taking care of one another. You find somebody to... See, I learned how to heal with Reiki because yeah, Reiki, yeah. I want to learn how to fix people. <laughs> Same thing as me becoming a minister. I can marry you. All right, then I can heal you. It's a one-stop shop, that one farm. Stop. You come to the middle of nowhere, there's we can fix all your problems. There's music. And you're going to love the tunes, <laughs> yeah, right? Man, no. We can fix you up, and you're going to love the tunes. That's and funny. the food's always good. Fucking amen. Right? Yeah, you got a good vibe. Are we done? No. No? no? The We're fuck? doing this Why for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Hell no. Done. You got Holy somebody crap. live here. Yeah, we got some We got time. some things to question you about. Yeah, we, hey. got, we got a little more time. I'm here. You down? I'm I doing mean, nothing I, but this I know today. rush hour is coming fast, but you're living up north. So. No, but I'm a driver. So don't worry about me and rush hour. All right. That's why they make shoulders. Yeah, right. I'm that. I mean, when That's I used, right. That's right. I ride bikes too, right? So yeah. When I used to yeah. ride my bike. The shoulder was my favorite lane. So you, you have a bike currently? I have, I have three. And what are they? I've got a Decker, mm -hmm. which is a hundred anniversary. Oh, nice. Yep. The all white. They call it the wedding cake bike. Okay. And then, well, I can tell you this because 20 years ago I had a farm and I grew marijuana on the farm. The story is I lost everything because the cops showed up. I lost 8 million bucks in one day. Lost my farm, lost everything. Even to the point that the, the court said I couldn't have a bike. And I was doing 1122 and my son Dylan rode up on this nice little Sportster with a 1380 in it. And I went, who scoots that? And he went, it's yours. What do you mean? He goes, me and the boys bought it for you for Father's Day. Just a minute. I think I remember this. Yeah. And th this is the best part. I go, who oh, are you going to get your mom for Mother's Day? And they go, well, she don't ride. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great idea. That great is good, line. yeah. Right? She don't ride. Uh -huh. Do you still have the sporty? Oh, yeah. And I, to tell you the truth, that's what I like riding. Yeah, it's fun. I love riding that bike. It's like you whip it around. It's got a 1380. You can stand it up if you have to. Yeah, man. You know, the Buell, you heard about the accident I had, right? No. You didn't hear about the accident I had on the boys? I'm prepping the boys. I'm doing shadow hunters and the boys. I'm working way too many hours. I'm going, they call me to do a survey. I just had my race Buell tuned up. So I go, let me just put my bike away. And I jumped on it and I hit it and I hit a pothole and the front wheel came up and as it came up, I pulled on it and the back wheel went through it. So I'm on a, I'm on a 90 and we're at 7.7 we're at seven, seven Kipling in the, in the horseshoe. So I'm going to hit a pole or I'm going to hit a honey wagon. So I dump it and I egg beat it. Oh. I break my knee off and I break my shoulder. Whoa. And the real funny part about it was there was about 14 crews there when it happened. Mm. And I got to tell you, the stunt guys, poof, I'm on a mat. Poof, they got tarps up all around me. Yeah. And it was really funny because Dean phoned Marco and Marco goes, uh, he seems okay. And Dean goes, is his head okay? And Marco goes, Eddie, does this remind you of anything? I go, yeah. When you fell off the roof at 940 Lansdowne, I was the one holding the mat. And he looks at me and he goes, no, Dean, he's all good. He didn't hit his head because he knew that I remembered that. And that, yeah. was, that was a scary night. It was a crazy game. That was a scary night. Yeah, man. I thought he died. Marco slid off the roof, bro. Oh, really? He had, oh, hit, he had hit a roof, but he went off the edge. Oh. In front of all of us. And then licked the ground like. How high? He How hit, high hit a railing. It? Hit the railing. But he was hurt. And like, you know, I was there. It was crazy. How high, really? Like how how far was, did he it fall? Was fall? It was a he could have died. That's how and it was okay. dead serious. He yeah, broke well, off yeah. his 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 little bumps on his spine got taken off. Fuck. And, you know, but if you want to talk about stunt guys that have had hard times, we'll talk about Shane Cardwell. <laughs> he got he got uh, more bumps and scratches than I'll, any stunt I'll, man I know. I'll have Shane in the, yeah. on the show and he you should have Shane. He, on. he can tell his own stories. But. No, I'll tell you. You know what I know. Shane, I was there for a bunch of Shane's big accidents. 
And we were in Montreal one time. We're all in the hot tub, and he gets out. He looks like a, you know how you put, if you have a scar and you get out of the hot tub, it looks like a line? Yeah. He looked like a road map, bro. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding, like a busy one, like Detroit or something. Like Dang. his road map was serious. Dang. But he's also the cowboy stunt guy. I got this. Nah, I don't need that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. those days are over, but. Yeah, he's one of the, he's an original. He's an original. For sure. And he actually, if he walked in this room right now, you know he's a stuntman. Have you seen um, the movie Quentin Tarantino's about the stuntman, um, Dead Proof? Oh, Dead. oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You seen that? Yep. That's Shane. When you see the guy walking with the silk jacket on, standing there all cool and shit, that was okay. Shane. Am I lying? No, you're not. <laughs> he's, he's the, you know, Shane was that cool stuntman that walked in with the Stunts R Us jacket and he had the look, right? He was that cowboy guy. Right on. You know? Right on. You should have Shane on here. I'm trying, Shane's coming to the Bowman Center. Yeah, you mentioned that. Right? Yeah. I'm going to have a bunch of guys out this year. That's so cool, fun. man. It'll be a bunch of real yeah, cool I'm people. I'm excited to come out there. You're going to love it. It's a lot of fun. And that's why we do it. That's the whole reason we do it. Because it is a pain in the ass and it costs us money every time. Yeah, yeah. But it's well worth it. Right on, man. You know, I did six trips in a <clears> truck <throat> to the city. I said, I'm working harder driving here than I've ever done on a film just to get our show off the ground. You know, because it's really easy for the key grip to go, Dad, there's a pickup here. Dad, there's a pickup there. Like Jake, Jake's the boss, right? And it's like, Dad, I need this picked <laughs> up. I need that picked up. And you got you got the dually and the pickup truck and the, and the car trailer. Go get everything. The boys are great. You know what? Your boys are great. I got to tell you, I'm blessed. Yeah. And I tell people that I, as you can say whatever you want. I've gone through my life. If I died, I'll say it right here. If I died tomorrow because of some fluke, I live my life to the fullest. And you know what? There's no problem dying as long as you've lived. That's the truth. There's a lot of people. They not, Like I say, we live people's dreams. They look at us and they go... That's what you do for a living? Yeah, and they make me breakfast on the way in. <laughs> That's the funny part. Right. Jesus, wait till I swallow my water. <laughs> right? But am I lying? No, you're they, not. They That's show up and they know what I want for breakfast. Yeah, man. Like, David's no I don't even have to say nothing. I walk up and they make me breakfast. They know what I like to eat. It's beautiful. That's not a bad gig, right? No. It, you know, it, all, man. when people work in civilian jobs, um, they take, they eat breakfast before they leave, or pick up a coffee, or Timmy's or a bagel on the way. Yeah, man. Or something. And we get to go and have bacon and eggs and blah blah blah, whatever you want. Yeah. Um, first thing in the morning, and then they <clears throat> make me my lunch, and I have a choice of lunch. And then if we work a little longer, then I get second check, and we get another yeah. meal. Yeah, bring in the pizza. And uh, I can be going to the craft service truck all day long. And yeah. There are people who complain about. No, no, and you know what? Totally. I, I got to tell you, I PM'd a show one time. I did a show called Remember Me, and we were shooting out in Picton. And I remember the, the, the ridiculousness of, I had to buy second meal. Not knowing if we were going to go into that time, but I had to buy it because we were out there. So I'm one of those guys. I'm spending a thousand bucks on dinner I, I don't want to throw it out so I walk up to the DP and I go can we break for 10 minutes to give everybody this food I don't need it but I don't want to waste it so, absolutely so we give out submarines and this grip Sweet. this grip comes up to me and he goes hey man I don't know if you know it or not but these are supposed to be hot substantials <laughs> I lost my shit <laughs> I was gonna smack him right it's like it's a free sandwich bro yeah. That I didn't even have to give you. Yeah. Like, I didn't have to give you that sandwich. Yeah, he doesn't know what went into <clears throat> getting this in the Has first place. no idea. Well, the, that's my point exactly. That's exactly what the he's The lack saying. of gratitude in some people. Like, they oh, expect yeah. it. Like, what do you mean? This should be a hot... You're getting a free sandwich. You don't like the lunches being provided on this show. Yeah. Then bring a sandwich in a brown paper bag and go sit in the corner. I said it to a driver one time because he was complaining and I said, what'd you do before you worked in the film business? He went, I was a cement truck driver and I go, so then your dinner truck was and you went, you owed the guy for that lousy That's right. sandwich yeah. you got off the truck. Something right? plastic, yeah. wrapped in plastic. Right? Yeah. And now you're complaining that they're making us oh, pork chops and chicken. I love it when they go, they got us chicken again. Yeah, because chicken's safe. Shut up. Chicken's good, man. No, but that's Bring a no. It every day. No, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> nah, yeah, yeah. It's like, shut up. It's a free meal. 
that's the only thing that bothers me in our business. Yeah, I agree. Is like I totally be happy. Agree, man. Yeah. Come here with an attitude and have a good day. That's what it should be. Yeah. Because our job. If like I have a good time most times, it's very rarely you. You know this. How, yeah. how how many times have you seen me having a shit day at work? Not very often. No, I I get hugs. That's what. No, I get. but that's what I'm saying. I've 100%. been more than lucky. Uh, don't get me wrong. I've had those moments where you're like, holy shit, I can't believe all this can happen in one day. <laughs> yeah. But on the majority of it, I love my life and I love doing the job that we do. Of course, man. So, but that's other people couldn't do our job. Other people can't do what we do. And I'm glad that I got into it. I'm, you know, I've known your dad for 40 years. We we don't see each other all the time, but when we see each other, it's like, hey! Yeah, there's no time you, between friends. No, brother. you know what I mean? But you see people that you've known no. for 40 <laughs> years. Before you were born, I met your dad. Before my kids were born. And then to see you guys all grow up, like when I seen that video of you guys singing, I started laughing. I went, that's awesome. Because, you know, it's like it's his kids job. and my kids working together. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's... Yeah. That is the awesome shit in our business is where someday if my granddaughter is a hairdresser in the business, how cool would that be? When is she good? Because I'll be just a story by then. Yeah. I'll be a, I'll be a yeah. story of a legend of somebody that worked in the business. Like people will go, oh, your papa was fast, daddy. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah. I, those days, and your your uncle's Jake and your dad's Sonny. You know what I mean? And you, like Jenny's, my ex-wife is uh, one of the best hairdressers in Canada. Like she's won all the awards. She's won Emmys and all that. Wow. So, so that's our industry. That's what we do. Oh, uh, I got a major thing I got to tell you guys. Go. Cool. I am meeting with Paul Bronfman next week because I want to start something. I want to start the Bent Oscars. And the Bent Oscars is the Heart and Soul Award for filmmakers. And it's an Oscar bent over. <laughs> bent Oscars and it's, okay. it's for all the people behind the scenes that can never win an award that's I'm fucking brilliant with this. and it's like for my friend Janina 50 years of being an accountant wow I want her to get the first one Tony Luchabello 40 years as a first AD mm -hmm. these people never get no Emmys getting fucked they get nothing at the end they get a figure we don't even get a watch you know the IA gives you a pin big deal Mm -hmm. what I want to do is give people you know the stunt Oscar is a guy that's like bent over and he's and he's and he's holding his leg or something each one will be <laughs> the accountant will be her doing a curtsy but bent over it's going to be called the bent Oscars it's going to be the heart and soul award for the people behind the scenes right on is this actually happening I'm working on it right now yeah I'm having a meeting with Paul Bronfman. I've talked to him well, about it. There needs to be one in this If house. anybody can get it done, you can. Well, that's what I'm working on it. That's why, you know, if you don't, you can, it's all well and good to say things, but I actually, yeah, I get at it. And when ah. you're talking to Paul, you tell him that you know a couple of guys that are looking for some investors in film. Oh, yeah? Yeah, just what? What film do you want to do? Oh, we'll talk after this. Because you know I got film, right? Yeah. We well. got one that we're going to do at the farm called Dark Acres, and I'm writing that right now. Yeah, let's, also, let's we, talk. We also have... Uh, Organized Luck, which is about a gangster that won the lottery, which is unbelievable. I wanted Tom Sizemore to play it. But we, we have a bunch of scripts. Like we did we did a pilot called Hard and Steel that I played Hard and Steel and uh, threw Dean off a strip joint in Hamilton and I'll send it to you. Too. Yeah, I love to see it. a bunch of stuff we did. But, we, you know, I was, I was doing the Saw movies and started getting pissed off at the way everything was. So I went, fuck this. I'm just going to start writing my own shit. And I went home and started writing. Right on, man. And we now have three series and four features that are ready to go. And I have a new series I'm working on right now called Alphabet Soup. And the Alphabet Soup is all the people from the CIA, MI6, right. that didn't make it. And they become a film crew. And they travel the world doing shit to people that shouldn't be done. Alphabet Soup. Interesting. It's interesting, yeah. Right? Yeah. Because I'll tell you. They're all, all letters. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> right? CIA, FBI, yeah, MIA, yeah, all of them. It's yeah. alphabet soup, and it's all the people that didn't really make it for one reason or another, <clears> but they're really good at what they do, and they become a film crew. And this organization takes them and makes them a film crew. So, if you really wanted to do some work, say I needed you to do some operative work, Sault Ste. Marie, say there's a guy up there that's whatever. You send a film crew up there, 
Nobody thinks nothing of it. They could set up in front of the guy's house. Now you got an effects guy. You got a stunt guy. You got a trans. You could do whatever you wanted to make the guy lose his mind so he leaves town or make him look like he did something that he didn't do. The film business can do anything. We can make we can make somebody look just like you walk in and rob a bank. Right. Right? If we wanted to, we could end up have visual effects, do your like a uh, prosthetics, do your mm. face and everything on somebody that looks similar to you. Yeah. We could set somebody up no problem, <clears throat> where you could say, "That's not me." Sure, it's not. Right. So Alphabet Soup does that shit. Okay. Remember the series effects? Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Kind of like effects, but yeah. it's called Alphabet Soup. Yeah. That's neat. Yeah. That's what we're working on right now. Good for you. That's cool. awesome. Well, that's what we're all trying to do. And, uh, it, absolutely. And you know what? Yeah. That's the whole reason we're up and on sound that we're trying to get the uh, the half million dollar budget from there too, for anything above a certain line. It's it's along that line, and if we can do that, because I know we could do. Uh, Dark Acres is about uh, a campsite. It's a private campsite, which is the best campsite ever. But the people that are there, if you don't have a good soul, they take your soul. And they take your shoes and they hang them in the woods. But what they do is they get everybody fucked up on the special tee to see where you're really at. And it's going to, the whole thing that we're, I've watched, I did the Saw movies, I did all those. I know what scares you. What scares you is usually this, where you can't see it, right? So that's what we're going to do. And Dark Acres, I have all the Hmm. people. They're not going to be regular actors, they're going to be people we know that are on a crew. You know, I want the lead guy to be a grip that I know that you probably know him, Luke Gordon. I'd have to see him. He, this guy can have a conversation right now. If Luke was here, he could pretend he's an Indian guy running a Seven Eleven that's having an argument with an Irish guy, and a Jamaican guy, and a Chinese guy. Oh, really? And he could do it all in sequence. Oh no, it's, shit! It's actually freaky to watch this guy do it, but he does it, and I want him to play the lead. So you think he's the killer? But he's not. It's his sister. But you meet this guy. He changes personalities in the show so that you see him. All of a sudden, he's an Irish guy. And I told those guys, you're not allowed in here. And he speaks with the with the accent and everything. That's great. Right? So then you think he's the crazy killer, and then you find out it's his sister. And they hang the shoes up in, the, in a tree. So when you look, there's going to be like as many shoes as we can steal to put in the tree. And that's, okay. those, are, those are the bad souls that had to leave them there. Interesting. And what happens to the souls? Where do they go? Well, that's a question of time, my friend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I could give you that answer. I got a lot of <laughs> shit going on, bro. <laughs> I think our souls go into the next universe, but you know, nobody's come back to tell us for sure. They don't stay in there with the shoes. And the weirdest part about this is, is that you know the the, the Danforth Bridge where they put up all that stuff so people couldn't jump off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the pay duties told me that people jump off there every day. Like there, there was like, you know, five, six people a week go off that bridge. So you're driving down to DVP, bang in front of you, bang. He says, that's what happens is you're driving along, some guy hits in front and you run him over. Oh, man. Well, you know, that's like for your head. Jeez. Right? So that's why they did that. And he said, no, it's a really weird part, is Eddie? I go, what? He goes, they always take their shoes off to jump. And I went, why did he do that? He goes, nobody's come back to tell us. You know what? He goes, they all take their shoes off, but no, nobody's, nobody's come back to, to tell, tell us, us why they take their shoes off. You gotta wonder why, though. Right? <clears throat> yeah, that's a little... It's your last minute of grounding, I guess. What's interesting is you're leaving your souls behind. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Hence the whole wow. soul thing. What the fuck? What happens to souls? It's going on right they now. They get worn out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And hung by a tree somewhere. Yeah, right? yeah. That's it. Oh, that's hilarious. Oh, that's interesting. Well, Eddie, we can uh, slowly sort of tie this up, but um, we're wondering if you'd do us the honor of signing our table. Absolutely. Man, that'd be great. Absolutely. Pick your spot. Anyway. Yeah, pick something uh, uh, yeah, somewhere, somewhere nice and clean. And for those that are listening, that is the marker. That's the Sharpie. Doing its regular thing near the end of a podcast. Sweet. 
you Thank go. you, sir. You're going to like it. You're going to like it a lot. Love it, man. That's what I tell chicks just before we get down. <laughs> you're going to like this, and you're going to like this a lot. <laughs> and they're doing shirts for Bowman Sound that's got a picture of me on the front. Yeah. And on the back, it's going to say, you're going to like this, and you're going to like this a lot. Right on, man. And then we're going to get sweater cat shirts <laughs> made. So if you sing with the sweater cat, you get a sweater cat. Okay, sweet. I, I, want, I want to. I'm I want you to come up. Sing, glad you, I'm going to tell you, you guys are going to come up. You're not going to want to leave my place. You're not. You're going to go. You're exactly what you're going to say. Eddie, if I put a motorhome, can we come and stay here? Because it's actually the most beautiful spot in the world. Wow. Like some, some, I'll send you some of the pictures of the ties that we have and the bands that we have. Everybody just has an unbelievably good time. I can that, only imagine. And that's it all we so want. Great. That's all you, in life. That's what you want. You want people to come and visit and have an awesome time, and we've had it every time. That's fabulous, right? Yeah, man. You you seem to live uh, properly. You know? I try. I try. Some people might argue that point. Have you have you been have you had this kind of attitude the whole time? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. pretty much as long as yeah. I've known. Yeah, pretty Eddie. much. I've yeah. lived this life, man. But you kind of have to to be where I'm at. If not, you'd become a miserable old fucking transport guy that barks at everybody. Yeah, I know that guy. Yeah, yeah we all know him. And mm -hmm. I try not to be that guy. I try to never be that dickhead that I've seen so many times. And I know why they're dickheads. You get you get some tired of people asking you really stupid questions sometimes. You know, like you're sitting in your car. They come and bang on your car and go, do you know where craft service is? Yeah, it's by the unit like it always is. Yeah. You know, but they'll come and ask me that because I'm the boss. And when you say about my hat, this is the reason I wear hats like that, is so that if somebody asks you, do you know where Fast that is? You go, right there. See that okay. hat? Yeah. That's why I started wearing them. Right on, man. You got a good look. That's yeah. how it works. So is that it now? Yeah, it did, brother. Thanks so much. Thanks, Eddie, for coming, brother. Thanks yeah. for having me, man. Yeah, man. And you'll see me on. again. I'll come back. This is good laughs and shit. Time. Yeah, come yeah, back. Man. Eddie, take two. Yeah, going again. And he takes two again. That's awesome. All right. All right then. Cut it, B.